today I would like to talk about um, energy conversion and harvesting devices for printed electronics and what we can do with them. Uh, and as Daniel mentioned, my research group at KAUST, uh, Organic and Hybrid Materials for Energy Applications Omega Lab, actually has grown um, from a very small lab since 2017. And as of today, we are over 20 group members uh, working for uh, one of the biggest pressing issues globally, which is energy. And because the problem is very big, um, it has multiple dimensions and we're trying to cover some solutions with the energy harvesting devices. And to name the first, our group's efforts are focusing on first photovoltaics, uh, which I will uh, be talking today. Um, and these photovoltaic devices, along with new materials, offer ultra lightweight or high power per weight devices, or you can make them semi-transparent, which are quite different than the existing silicon ones or tin film technologies. And because we can give them these functionalities, um, flexibility or even stretchability, etc., we can power them for the IoT devices for future. So the second um, topic also I'll be talking uh, will be about thermoelectrics, where instead of sunlight, now you use the waste heat and convert them into electricity. And our aim here is actually to utilize uh, low temperatures, as low as body temperature. And we are uh, working towards if we can make use of this energy and convert them into electricity and use that for also ultra low power electronics. And how we do them, uh, we actually combine printing in both different uh, device configurations and we would like to utilize them in, in printing technologies. So, of course, in order to use printing, it comes with the, with the discovery of materials and we're using, in this respect, molecular inks or soft organic materials. You, call, you can call them polymers or small molecules etc but basically based on carbon and for me this is the most fascinating part because my whole research background comes with uh, from the organic materials even synthesis and use them for different applications i find them fascinating because these soft materials are easily deformable or reshaped or even actually functionalized uh, at room temperature and you can use them for various applications. And because these are synthetically made materials, you can actually tune their optical and electronic properties by changing a single atom in these molecules, which is um, really, really amazing. And that allows us actually to use these molecular inks as inks to the printing um, uh, technologies. So what printing offers in this respect, uh, printing with solution processable materials or molecular inks are quite, is quite different to wafer scale production. First of all, I have to mention that the whole world going through the phase of sustainability and that we realize that we can't do this to our world, we need to get away from very energy intense production mechanisms as well and make us ourselves think how can we do that and one way is actually printing um, if you really know how a silicon wafer is made or if you ever been to count core labs you will understand what i really mean and if you come to our labs one day and how we do printing in ambient conditions and actually um in a continuous coating, you will understand how less energy intense these uh, techniques can be. So with printing, as I said, we can print materials as a continuous coating as our newspapers for different, obviously, techniques. And we can also achieve unusual form factors, which is quite interesting and uh, actually amazing for the future applications. And this will allow us for the flexibility uh, and different processing conditions and applications, such as now display technologies, OLEDs, OFEDs, transistors, any electronics, you name it. So as I said, this printed electronics, besides being less energy intense, it can be also low cost um, that offers simple production and highly scalable um, 
besides uh, wafer scale. You can really do sheet to sheet or even um, roll to roll. And you can add further functionalities to these molecular inks, which I will share today with you, um, that you can make them flexible, stretchable, and even healable. And you can make them on different surfaces and substrates that actually Shaika uh, have talked about yesterday. You can, you can bring conformality uh, to them. And then you can also apply them for the in-situ applications, um, for instance, for also shape memory type devices or give further functionalities to the printed materials that you uh, work with. You can customize, as you all know, also from uh, 3D printing, which I will briefly touch in the, in the second part of my talk, uh, and it's an additive manufacturing. You can do simple patterning compared to um, subtractive methods or lithography, and you can really achieve high resolution as well uh, and most importantly, you can integrate with other components, even with printing too. And the nice part is also you can work for rapid manufacturing applications for the future's demand. So then why we need to use this printing with the energy harvesting devices, as I said, the energy demand is growing in today's world. And I had some numbers, I've been looking actually annual um, human electricity consumption is in, in 23 billion kilowatt hours, if I'm not mistaken, and it's really on the steady rise. And that means we need to do something for it. And this something should also offer as sustainable solutions as possible, as I said. Uh, and energy that actually is captured from abundant resources and also sustainable and free resources, such as light, um, is obviously, uh, um, you know, really a go away for, for this type of applications. Um, but in today's world, at this, like uh, today's applications, people are aiming at using them Internet of Things or low power electronics, as I said, or wearables or sensor networks for, for the future. Um, and as I said, why, why it becomes so important printing is, um, Thanks to Daniel providing this quote to me, I find it fascinating also because a third digital revolution already happened and it is obvious that it's even far more significant than the invention of writing and even of printing, the Douglas um, Engelbart said, a, an internet pioneer. Um, so we, this is happening and we need to be part of it and we need to bring energy solutions to all those devices in the future. Uh, <clears throat> from let's say healthcare, smart healthcare or mobility or energy or smart cities and whatever you can think of. Um, so some of the new horizons to the printed electronics you can find actually on the internet uh, is on smart labeling and packaging. Um, for instance, in order to reduce food uh, waste, you know, we need to go for smart packaging and labeling, which tells you, you know, you need to consume some of the food on its time or if it's already passed or due, uh, or maybe in the future, it will tell you even more things to be actually clever. Um, another thing is also obviously on the wearables and even implantables. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Levi's and I think Google made a, a jacket a while back, which had some actually, um, electronic items in the jacket, which was also washable, etc. Uh, and then this will even gear towards the electronic skin and the robotics also that you can expand, which is very, very interesting. And the last part, we had the talk yesterday on biosensing and uh, even diagnostics, like how can we do um, maybe even single use electronics, you know, that is that is not contributing further to the electronic waste if we can make them biodegradable or further sustainable. But one thing in this whole um, electronic devices strikes me is that all these electronics will need a power source, right? And what happens now is these very soft, conformable and light electronic circuits use these heavy bulky batteries, um, which is not looking nice and definitely need some improvement to make it fully integratable and fully printed actually. So we believe that we can take part of, of uh, this with our energy harvesting um, solutions. 
So another important thing to look at actually how flexible electronics grew over the decades is also pretty interesting and you can understand from here where it is also going. So initially um, where people were trying to do just flexible substrates, uh, nowadays it just moved on to further functionalities as I said like stretchable or even healable if you look for and then people um, now or self-healable here and people today want to print all those layers and even possibly integrate them in the same uh, substrate which will be the challenging part for the for the future so in terms of that functional printing there are several ways that we can print these molecular inks as i mentioned um, and you name it there are a lot other techniques out there too so here you can find just some of them uh, flexography gravier inkjet printing or screen printing so what makes you define or determine which kind of printing you want to do is obviously you need to think of your investment and how much money you would like to spend on it but also a lot on the material properties because some printing techniques um, require certain obviously viscosities and control over inks and also material usage and, and waste. But with this uh, different types, you can go for really high speed, high resolution, or sometimes you can have just lower speed as screen printing, but it's I think quite cheap and, and you can have uh, still patterning. And in my talk today, I will focus first part on the on the inkjet printing, which is actually high control and accuracy, and we can get high resolution as well for um, small integrated circuits. So the drop on demand inkjet printing, um, people gave some introduction yesterday, but just to briefly cover, is uh, consisting of a piezo element that you actually apply a certain voltage and then you can control the um, drop as you see on drop on demand and use is as an ink reservoir with a nozzle head and put it like in a printer we have at home or at work. Um, the only nice bit is you can do several different shapes with this, as you see on the bottom left, um, Daniel's printing a leaf actually, and you see the proper drops here. So you need to consider actually viscosity, very importantly, surface tension as well. And um, you need to have material properties or actually ink properties, not material, uh, which should lie between um, roughly um, these ranges. And in terms of volatility, that's also very uh, much affecting your printing because if you have smaller droplets and so on and so forth, you need to think of what kind of um, solvents you need to use not to have any clogging in your printing. And in order to have fine resolution, obviously, in the end, you need to optimize your um, drop spacing and um, substrate ink interaction which is very very critical and i will show you why it's very important so then you can get to actually with different droplet amounts you can uh, achieve different resolutions as you see here um sorry and then yeah once you have droplets um you can dry your film and have a continuous film if it's your lucky day so Printing is just actually a method, and then the whole ink is the key in this um, in this printing method and the processing, obviously. And you need to consider several different um, parameters until you have an um, successful printing. And if you're not buying an ink that is already commercially available and suitable for inkjet printing, and you have to actually develop it for your um, purposes and find out a new material or a device, which uh, we are doing, you need to look for solvent properties, solubility, if they're stable or not, how they dry actually, and how the surface treatments, you know, and optimization of your of your printing itself. So there are several, several factors and all the results I'm gonna show you actually passed through all these optimization stages um, already. So when, how, or let's say, how do we formulate our ink? Because that is one of the key, as I said, um, in the inkjet printing. So one way 
to look at it is actually you can calculate the solubility of your material in that particular solvent, right? And in several ways or very, let's say, easy way as well and look when it starts to precipitate and centrifuge, et cetera. However, if you're using new and novel materials and they are very expensive, you don't want to waste all this material. And instead, you can use Hansen solubility parameters and you can predict the um, solubility of your material uh, that will really help you in order to print eff effectively. And in order to do that, you're looking to cohesive energy density and then the um, Hildebrand parameters, where actually it looks for the solute and the solvent interactions. So um, Hansen solubility parameter considers actually three um, different specifications of a solute or a solvent, which is actually the polar and dispersive forces that are effective and the hydrogen bonding. And by considering this for the solute and the solvent, uh, you can actually create a solubility sphere, as you see here in green, that tells you actually if your material will be soluble in that specific solvent or not, or a combination of solvents. So in, when you calculate this distance Ra, considering this um, um, dispersive and polar forces between the solvent and solute, you can calculate this Ra, okay? And this, uh, when this Ra and R0 give you an RED value, okay? And if this is less than one, which means your dot, your so solvent solution is within this sphere, that means you can actually dissolve it. And then if when it's outside means that it's not a suitable uh, solvent or it's called a non-solvent. I'm not going to into detail, but however, there are several different ways that you can bring actually two non-solvents into a soluble form, which I find fascinating because it is actually the um, linear regression of this two. So if you have a, a point here and on the other side of the sphere, and then you can actually combine these two and then bring the combination within the sphere of, of your solubility. So this is how we predict initially for the um, solubility parameters of our materials. And once you have that, you need to think that if it's gonna be printable, and in order to do that, you get the Weber number and the Reynolds number, which considers actually a um, couple of important parameters like the um, viscosity uh, and the surface tension here, um, which is quite significant for the Weber and the um, viscosity for the Reynolds number. You look where you are and if, if you're in the printable range, then you say, okay, this in formulation is good for printability. So before doing that though, you need to have a huge library for your solvent and, um, and viscosity, as I said. So here I'm showing you P3HD, poly-3-hexyltiophene, one of the um, kilogram scale donor polymer uh, that is used for photovoltaics or and actually several other applications. And you see it's so solubility in several different solvents. And also here, you see the viscosity of several different solvents at, uh, and their boiling points. So you think like, first of all, we have a lot of options, right? And when we want to put it into the printability range, however, you see that actually very few of them can fit into this printability range. Um, so in order to have very effective and large area or scalable um, processing, you need to do this and make sure that you're in the right range. So once we settled, actually, let's say this whole how we print, how we do the ink formulation, uh, actually how we process it, etc. I want to move on to the problems and how we um, print our functional energy harvesting devices. And the first one will be about the organic photovoltaics. So photovoltaics, I hope you're all familiar with actually using sunlight and convert them to electricity. Fine. And commonly it's done with a silicon or cadmium telluride or even nowadays perovskite materials. However, organics, I told you, are molecular inks and I was very interested in. Uh, and what happened in the last three, four years, actually, with the discovery 
of uh, new materials, new organic materials, the uh, power conversion efficiency performance of these uh, devices increased hugely. And given the fact that the, they can be, as I said, semi-transparent, ultra lightweight, et cetera, we thought this is actually quite a good motivation for us if we can print them and scale them up because then you can transfer them, uh, which is a huge cost for, cost for silicon photovoltaics and you can just roll them up, et cetera, et cetera. So we started first um, with a known, as I said, P3HT, which is a donor molecule, and an IDTBR, which is an acceptor molecule and that is needed as in the photoactive layer of a, a solar cell. So you blend these two materials and normally in the lab scale, you use a method called spin coating, uh, which is suitable only for small area cells. And here you see the results of the power conversion efficiency from this technique. So what we wanted to prove here is if we can inkjet print this ink and keep the uh, performance similar. So then what we did here, if in the red curve, if you see, this is a um, common current voltage curve for a, for a photovoltaic device under light condition. And in this red curve, you're seeing that we're using actually uh, dichlorobenzene as a solvent, which is chlorinated and actually not environmentally friendly, but most of the high uh, performances are achieved with this type of solvents. And actually quite, the performance is quite nice. And here you see the external quantum efficiency, basically telling you how much of the entering photons are converted into electricity. So 50% of the photons incoming between these wavelength regions are effectively converted. And when actually um, Daniel tried to make this okay, we can now inkjet print it and can we try to go for larger areas? Then uh, it was also quite fascinating that we could um, produce up to two square centimeter, which is, I have to say one square centimeter is usually the accepted range for scaling up because this type of materials are scaled up with um, roll to roll coating, et cetera. And they are uh, with, the line width are usually uh, one centimeter. So this was also quite nice. However, when we try to stay away from these chlorinated solvents, which we find them environmentally hazardous and move for more um, non-chlorinated or environment friendly ones, as you see, the performance was um, dropping for several factors, which I'm not going into detail. However, we worked heavily on this, uh, try to improve and understand all these ink uh, formulations to bring this up to the standards. So here I wanna show you another interesting thing. I told you with this type of printing, you can go for free form factors. And here Daniel printed a marine turtle um, because we are by the Red Sea, uh, inspired by that, I guess. And then um, evaporated in this case, some electrodes. However, you can also print electrodes on top. As I said, this was actually proving just if we can inkjet print the photoactive layer and our inkjet printed um, results were also um, comparable to the lab scale devices, which was quite nice. So then we moved into um, potentially high performance materials, as I showed you in the first slide of the organic photovoltaics. And this is another uh, photoactive layer, PTB7TH, as donor polymer and an IEICO4F as an acceptor material. And in this case, as you see, we moved away from these uh, chlorinated solvents and we optimized this printing with an environmentally friendlier solvent called xylene and achieved around 9.5% efficiency. And here you see actually the design um, architecture for the photovoltaic device where you need to have an electron transport layer in this art, uh, architecture, the photoactive layer and a whole transport layer and an electrode, which is in this case silver. So we can process all these layers from solution uh, and actually um, print. However, on the whole transport layer, in order to get this performances, we need to evaporate the molybdenum oxide, um, which is actually a quite effective whole transport layer. However, it is not thermally stable. Uh, and also it's not scalable, as I said, with, or compatible with printing. 
So then we said, we started to think like, we definitely need a solution process, obviously thermally stable and also scalable whole transport layer. So that transport layer is actually gonna sit on the photoactive layer, if you realize. And for this reason, we moved from spin coating methodology for every layer and um, moved instead to inkjet printing and also another technique in coating called slot die coating, which is compatible with roll to roll coating as in this, um, this technology to scale up. So the slot die coating, what it happens in this case actually um, can offer two different mechanisms here. Either the head can be stable and the um, stage is moving, or you can have the other way around. You can have a, a stable stage and the head can move if you want to do sheet to sheet production. And as I said, we uh, did inkjet printing for all the layers. And also we wanted to compare the slot die coating with every single layer. So as I said, because we're looking for a whole transport layer that is gonna sit on the photoactive layer, we need to understand the interaction of the, um, the two layers. So one interesting fact here is most of the photoactive layers are hydrophobic because they're polymers and uh, small molecules. And most of the whole transport layers that are sitting on top are really hydrophilic, such as P.PSS. Um, so how can we actually then ensure wetting between these two non-compatible materials and also do not compromise on conductivity because it is it needs to extract the charges. So what we can do from using a contact angle uh, measurements uh, along with actually measuring the polar and dispersive forces, you can obtain a so-called wetting envelope okay, of your ink, in this case, ptb 70 h and 4F blend, I told you. So as if it was your um, solubility sphere, think it is in the 2D, anything lying in, in this uh, wetting envelope will actually wet your surface and anything outside will have a non-wetting behavior. And further, uh, by measuring also the contact angle, you can also understand the vertical phase separation within your layer. Basically, if your surface energy is changing because of your um, um, different material usage, for instance, we use polymers and small molecules and polymer tend to go up because of their surface energies, etc. So you can actually control this vertical phase separation or understand if it works or not. And why this is so important? Because in the photoactive layer, uh, we need to have an effective charge separation. And we call a, a P-type material should actually pin to the p-type side which is whole transport layer and the n-type material should um, go towards more to the electron transport layer and if it's not the case then you would have this vertical phase separation which hinders your charge transport so we created this wetting envelope for ptb 7 th as you see here you see for the donor and the acceptor and using different solvents, as in the first case, the chlorobenzene, chloronaphthalene, uh, we have found out that actually most of the donor material sits on the top if we coat it uh, with this type of solvents. And if we move to a more environmentally friendly solvent, um, then the acceptor molecule starts to be uh, on top, which is actually more suitable for conventional architecture with this type of envir environmentally friendly solvents. So then we were like, okay, now we know the wetting behavior. So let's see what kind of whole transport layers are out there. And if we will be able to fit in into our or onto our photoactive layer. So here, as you see, actually, a lot of uh, HDLs are staying outside of the uh, um, our wetting envelope, and the most of the uh, the gray ones, which are used as um, surfactants in order to make them wettable, is also not really suitable in this case. So then. Um, the other part is you see this pH 1000 or AL4083 or this combination with RDP dots are also not very suitable. So then if you try to make a, a, a layer on top of this with the um, 
let's say, materials out of your wetting envelope. Uh, we have observed this mechanical uh, strains and then the, uh, the electrodes were cracked up. And then obviously um, the conductivity was also decreased when we try to further um, um, increase the compatibility between the photoactive layer and the HDL based on the ethylene glycol in this case. And then we decided or realized that, okay, we really need to develop our own uh, HDL and try to look for solutions. And in this case, we moved to a, a PDL formulation mixed from alcohols, as you see, IPA or butanol or pentanol, which fits into this wetting curve, actually. Uh, we managed to find this red spot a combination or a for ink formulation that is suitable for this type of photoactive layer. And when we put it on top of our layer, you see a PTB7TH4F, uh, we didn't see any mechanical strain and we were able to have a uniform coating and printing. And also we were able to uh, keep the decent conductivity that is required to um, have it with the whole transport layer. And along with this, most importantly, we had to look for the um, conductivity of this with temperature because on top of this HTL, when you want to apply industrially uh, the electrodes, that also inserts some sort of temperature and even pressure, actually. And uh, then with this, we were ensuring that it also works. Then having ticked all the boxes for the efficient whole transport layer, we then move to print and code all the layers as I showed in the device architecture. And we managed to actually reach to 10% uh, power conversion efficiency um, with 0.75 and even one square centimeter devices. As I said, this is actually a really nice and breakthrough uh, with this type of performances. But what is more striking here, I would like to have your attention was when we printed our layers, here how the whole device looked like, as you see. And you can see at the back, the beacon of calcium. So this was quite impressive because if you look to the transmission of this uh, whole stack and also the single ones, you start with around, let's say 80 to 90% when there is no uh, photoactive layer and just ITO and zinc oxide. And when we add our photoactive layer, um, we were achieving actually almost 80% transmission. And even in the whole stack, we were uh, reaching to 50%. So this device was actually very, very semi-transparent. So why that is so important, uh, I would like to share this graph with you. So this is actually all the uh, different technologies Sorry, I missed the legends here, but these are different types of technologies. There are OPV, there are some Paris guides, et cetera, et cetera, and shows you a light utilization efficiency. Basically, this is the efficiency times the average visible transmission, like how transparent it is, and as a function of uh, the transmission. So as you see here, um, the more ABT you have, actually the performance goes down back again because simply you are uh, making more transparent layers. And if you look to our work, we are really um, actually um, outstanding in this respect, even comparing with this whole other technologies. So this initial uh, findings really inspired us at the time. And what we did was at Kaos, we had a startup uh, to go for actually transparent photovoltaics. And uh, here you see one of our modules that it works actually five by five centimeter. And we had won several startup awards, etc. So our vision at that time was actually use this um, semi-transparent devices for agrivoltaics because um, this particular combination actually is highly transparent where um, not only human eye sensitivity is actually very high, but also where plants need growth. So basically, if you use this combination, you can keep the parts that is required for the plants, but absorb the further infrared light and use this um, actually as the energy conversion while your plants can still grow happily. So this is now actually taken as a um, startup and moving on its own way. 
so moving forward, I want I showed you actually how this technology technically can be scaled up with this type of methods. But I just want to share a very brief um, results with you. Also, like, do we really have to scale this up? As I said, because with this today's IoT devices, we can even use very small ones and also ultralight ones. So could we really go small? So with the Inc. we developed in the first part I showed you, which was PTHDID TBR, we decided to move actually on completely conformable and ultra flexible substrates. And we got rid of our whole ITO glass, etc. And we developed another P.PSS here that can sit on it as an electrode. And we printed, fully printed, being check printed in this case, this photovoltaic device, as you see, that is sitting on actually a soap bubble. So it's extremely light, yet it is still very effective. If you see the glass version of this fully printed device, 4.7%, we were able to achieve 3.6% um, with this um, configuration, which is quite impressive. So why this is important, if you're looking for future applications, which I cannot even think of some stuff, but micro drones, I don't know, super light butterflies, etc. then your energy density becomes very, very, very important. So then the power per weight, uh, if you look for the different type of technologies, actually, this is just the initial result. Actually, nowadays, you can really triple up these values up to 10% I showed you. Uh, is actually really uh, like superior compared to other technologies. So this would be definitely a way to go if you wanna get such type of devices. So in the second part of my talk, very briefly, I wanna um, now shift the gears towards thermoelectric devices. So these thermoelectric devices, as I said, would like to capture the heat, and using that temperature difference, convert that into, into electricity. And in this case, you need also a P-type and an N-type leg, which will require for the um, actually electron flow. So this type of devices also could be used as power sources for conformable and stretchable uh, electronics. As you see here, these are quite bulky materials that are technically flexible, etc. But we're using the organic materials, we can make them actually biocompatible, even also add further self-healing elements, which I will show you in a minute. So first we want to start um, with another uh, workhorse material, P.PSS, that is used for several other applications as well as thermoelectrics. Uh, one pressing issue or question for the organic thermoelectrics, which today is still a question, is actually how to make them, let's say, thick enough. Because in, in thermoelectric materials, you need to have actually an out of plane temperature gradient that will give you a, a, a power, let's say. However, these devices are utilized to, uh, as of today as like a 2D and then the lateral devices. So everything measured is an in plane. Um, on the other hand, with their advantages and applications, we thought this is the first way to go with that in mind, like how could we make them very, very thick in the future? So we started with P.PSS, which is cheap, easy, easy, commercially available, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we know that ionic liquids actually have uh, shown before that they can actually dope or de-dope and control the microstructure and also give um, potential actually stretchability as well. So what we did here is we mixed these ionic liquids with PDOT in order to control the morphology and um, the thermoelectric properties. And in the end, we achieved actually um, stretchable devices using PDMS as the surface um, substrate, basically. So in thermoelectric devices, your conductivity sigma here or um, CBEC coefficient or totally um, power factor are the figure of merits that you usually look for the performance. And in term, in the end, it's ZT, a uh, demand um, unit list figure of merit. So what you can see here, the conductivity uh, of the PDOT itself 
uh, as a function of different uh, tensile strain goes really, really low after 20%. However, using the ionic liquids, we were able to keep this um, conductivity up, on, up to 70% um, strain and stretchability with these devices. Because if we want to use them in body applications, you need to be able to actually stretch um, to a certain extent. And then we also did different tests with the number of stretchings, etc. And then uh, we have seen um, actually up to 50 cycles, like relatively okay uh, conductivity scales. And then you can do the same thing for the CBEC, as I said, uh, which is also another important parameter and uh, both CBEC and the conductivity showed relatively reproducible results. And then in the end, we were able to actually um, apply this strain for the whole uh, ionic liquid added thermoelectric devices. So then we thought like, okay, this is good. Now we can have it stretchable. So could we then add further self-healing property? And then we used some commercially available uh, to start with materials. And in the end, here you see some of the ASCM images. We had a huge um, cut and then look into that. And we were actually still able to see that self-healing material was in there healed, let's say, um, and functioning. So this is our hypothesis that, you know, the, the um, self-healing material is actually bundled with the PDOT molecules. And when you cut it, um, it's supposedly healed back and then actually make those polymer chains again closer to each other. And here are the results. Sorry, here. Oh, where is it? Yeah. Here are the results that you see from those half healing photo um, thermoelectrics that we have our uh, material and then we do cut it when then you use the, uh, lose the photocurrent. And then when we actually stick it back to each other, again, it heals back and then you see your, your current again um, is as similar as the first one. And then also we, when we looked at the conductivity before and after the cut, we were, retaining almost similar conductivity values after actually several cuts for the for this thing and i don't know if you can see this um yeah so here we are cutting this thermoelectric material and you still see the led light is shining because the self healing property is so quick that it doesn't uh, let any unconnected uh, conductive path for the p dot electrodes, as you see, which was quite impressive. And then once we had that, we were like, okay, we have actually a printable and self healable material. So then can we really try to make it thick? And that was when we started to think about 3D printing and if it could be viable for such materials, which, has, uh, which was not done before. And obviously for this reason, 3D printer, as you know, the commonly commercially available ones are actually using filaments and um, mm, viscous inks or actually whole, how to say, solid filaments. However, in this case, we have non-viscous inks and we had to modify the 3D printer that could accommodate this property. And as you see here, we were successfully able to um, print the PDOT ink with this 3D printer. And you see here the legs for the thermoelectric with the P dot. And we combine with actually with a silver paste as an N type leg. And uh, when you look for the uh, IR camera, you could actually see, which is on the hot side, which was on a hot plate. And the other side of the um, module was actually cold enough. And when we could hold with our hands, at room temperature, where we only create, I think, a seven um, Kelvin difference, we were able to generate actually 0.6 millivolts in this case. And the performance of this thermoelectric modules are depending on actually how many legs you have. So the larger you can have, um, the higher the performance you would get. And if you look for the whole power, I think it's about nano uh, watts. However, as I said, it depends on the modulation that you're working on. So it definitely tells you there's a huge space actually to work on the device design in this type of materials and devices. 
So with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I hope I showed you new and better performing materials for efficient devices are needed. And for the future, then we, maybe we should consider biodegradable, more environmentally friendly solvents and processing. And um, we should also focus on more functional materials for unconventional electronics. And hopefully we will be able to talk in the panels uh, discussion. And also in, um, in the future, we are working currently all in integrated all plastic circuits. So basically, could we uh, bring all the electronic elements from organic materials on a single substrate and we can print that and so that we can use it for our sensing and diagnostics. So with all that, actually, I hope you're convinced that there's a great future with plastics and plastics are not all bad. So uh, last one minute, I want to tell you uh, if there are people outside CAS, which I really hope so, um, wanted to give you a glimpse about our campus. Um, so if you're interested actually in CAS or to come to CAS or visit, et cetera, uh, it's a very interesting experience and I really highly recommend it to do so. Uh, we are a graduate university on the shores of the Red Sea, which is beautiful. And this slide is a bit actually an uh, early slide. I think as of today, um, around 10,000 people live in the campus. Um, and I hope you can come one day. And if you're interested in the internship opportunities, you can also visit the VSRP page that you would actually find several existing and open projects that you can apply to. And even if there is no, that doesn't mean you cannot come. I really suggest that you write to one of the faculty that you're interested in and um, visit us in the near future. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have interest in this type of topics, please send me an email. And uh, if you're interested to do a PhD or a master's, please do send me an email as well and visit our website and Twitter for the further news on this type of topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Daria, for your uh, very, very nice talk. Now we come to uh, questions. So if you have a question, please uh, uh, type it in the Q&A or in the chat, or you can raise your hands and I can unmute you for you to uh, uh, question. So the first question that we have on the Q&A panel is, what type of material is most commonly used as an ink? Right, so... It really depends what you want to do, actually. <laughs> I would say you will find from yesterday's and today's talks P.PSS, which is a polymer, uh, P-type polymer, and it's doped one is commercially available and you can take it and you can do a lot of things with it already. Um, but uh, as I said, you can get silver inks, you can get nanotube inks, or you can even make your own ink as I showed you. So there are, there are several different types of materials you can use. I think you need to know first what to do with that ink basically. Okay, uh, all right. Anyone else have a question? Somebody asked right, this uh, webinar recording, so I think yes. She's, uh, you're thanking you for the, for the talk. Yes, we can uh, actually have the uh, recording later. I want to ask you a question in regards to thermoelectrics. Um, what do you think is the um, most important bottleneck in terms of processing the thermoelectric uh, vertically instead of sideways? Yeah, as I said, the, the method, first of all, <laughs> Uh, because with the 3D printing, that was one of the ways that we can we can go thicker. However, the, at the moment, the inherent material properties that is required, like the charge transport properties of organic materials are limited. So if you go for 10 micron or hundreds of microns or even millimeter, uh, then you would be, yeah, you would have issues um, in order to have decent um, electrical transport. I think thermal transport would be pretty good <laughs> because they are very poor thermal conductors, which is one of the 
motivation behind using these materials. However, in terms of electrical conductivity, um, yeah, we definitely need to design better materials. And then the second bottleneck, which we are heavily working on now, is because they need two legs, which P type and an N type. Um, there are very, very few N type materials that can be processed and printed. So basically, it all comes back to material discovery. All right. Yeah. We have a question from uh, Mukhtar Ahmad. He says, uh, or she says, do you have any suggestion for biodegradable conductive inks? Well, yeah, if you know any, we're happy to print as well, bring them over. <laughs> um, so yeah, there are several, again, depends on what you wanna use, but I think some sort of cellulose based inks, um, you can use them as biodegradable. I'm talking specifically for inkjet printing, but if you use for uh, 3D printing, there are PLA based ones that you can also uh, use that we know that they're biodegradable. Um, and um, yeah, I think some further nature inspired ones, you know, if you can, again, use in terms of printing, you can get them as, as biodegradable. Okay, perfect. Now we have another question from Jing Pu. Uh, this hi, professor. For the inkjet printing, are there are the multi layers printed together to dry, or you print the next layer until the lower layer is dry? <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry if I didn't make it clear. So if yeah, if you want to do that, you need to print one layer, wait it dries. That's why I said this property is important, and then you need to print the next one on top of it. So that's why it's quite important that how the beneath layer dries and what is the surface properties of that so that you can put the next one and the next one should not dissolve the beneath layer, right? So you need to use orthogonal solvents um, so that they can basically sit on top of it as two separate layers. So for instance, if you have a same alcohol-based or a water-based ink, you cannot print the next one on top of it. That's why a lot of surfactants or cross-linkers, for instance, are used or um, different type of um, solvents that you need to move. So that is a big challenge, let's say, uh, if you want to have uh, layers. All right. Now we have another question from Alejandro Carrasco. He says, are the methods readily available for a scaled up production and offer body sensor powered by thermoelectrics in a reliable and cost-effective way? Short answer is no. <laughs> so I think thermoelectrics are still are in their infancy, but it's very exciting and interesting idea if we can capture body heat, right? But there are still, still lots of discussions like, how much power we can generate from that and uh, actually how much area that we need because um, there's a very nice paper from Mariano Campoy on that, um, you know, our body area is basically limited. It's not like solar cells, you can put it in the whole world. So we nef definitely need to make it very effective, first of all, working. And also we need to make it with cost effective materials in the end. So there's, it all comes back again to material discovery that is suitable uh, for thermoelectrics. All right. Um, I have one question from uh, Urba Afnan. The question is for a materials engineer student with expertise in nanotechnology, what would you suggest as an area for prime focus if they wanna work on contribute on flexible transparent electronic devices? If they wanna work on? If they want to work on tra tra flexible, transparent electronic devices, what would be their focus? I think you need to figure out your interests. I, I mean, th the focus is already there, right? You mentioned <laughs> focus on transparent <laughs> devices. I think, um, where was that? I think in Eteha, maybe Switzerland. There are several groups working on this type of transparent oxides for like security devices or holograms or touch screens. Uh, and what you need to figure out is if you're good at either materials or devices. And then 
move further further to that you know because some of the groups work heavily on the device integration and physics and some group work on material development so if you're from nanomaterials and have interest on that you can focus on on those groups however if you think like you're very experienced but you want to learn on device then i think you can look for um, those type of different groups all right perfect and lastly i have two questions that have to do similarly with the same topic uh, they say some material requires calcite volatile solvent to solvent. How do you deal with them uh, safely without a glob box? And secondly, uh, the most efficient OPV are currently with DCV or chloroform based uh, solvents. Do you think that any other solvents can meet the efficiency or equivalent criteria for printing? Yeah, I think the second question could be best answered by Daniel, but I don't think he can answer it yet because he's writing the paper about it. Um, but uh, yeah, they they don't have to be. Yes, the most efficient ones are like from chlorinated solvents because we know that it's working in the field. I think it's easy to work with. However, we know that that's not the only alternative and we're really working towards that. And I can tell you today that you, you can really achieve good, very good efficiencies using and more environmental friendly solvents. And then the, going back to the first question, uh, what was it about again, um, Daniel? How do, you, how do you process them without a glob box? Oh, right. Yeah. So we put the inkjet printers in um, a few modes, actually. So there's still actually a, a solvent exhaustion uh, exists. You can use some sort of um, hoods on, on top of them. So even if they are... Uh, environmentally friendly solvents, we don't want that <laughs> our students smell that heavy uh, ink. So unless they're, I think, water-based, you always work in benches. So we're making sure that you are safe. All right, and we have two more questions. Uh, the first one is, for P and N type materials, do we process them by doping a semiconductor or are they naturally occurring materials? Yeah, very good question. Um, you dope them. Yeah, so I didn't touch base, but it's really the whole another topic, like because we make them conductive with doping and doping is a key material um, property in this type of thermoelectrics. Yes. All right. And one question by Francisco Garza. Has the deposition of nanoparticles, oxide, perovskites, etc., being thought to enhance the performance of OPVs in the different layers using the listed print methods in your lab? Or as of now, are you only focused in polymers? Right, so yes, you can use oxide. And in fact, if you look for our device architectures, they have oxides. However, we are interested in still printable oxides. And for instance, zinc oxide, you know, is one of the uh, electron transport layers we are using in our stacks and we do print it. Uh, perovskites you can actually inject print them as well if you want to. This is not in our interest now, but there are a, there's a startup company called Saule and they're trying to scale this up with uh, perovskites with inkjet printing. But yes, short answer, we are using different materials because um, organic material is just the photoactive layer and you need uh, several other layers to make a functional device. Okay, and uh, we have one question from Mohammed. He says, uh, Professor, do you think printable OPVs have more advantages under low intensity light conditions? Right, that's great. Yeah, you need to do some more reading. You're on the right track, definitely. Uh, so yes, organic materials are known to be more effective under low light compared to the inorganic ones. And uh, there are several work done for their indoor applications for IoT devices as well. And again, actually, Daniel, if you remember the company name, but I can't remember, from um, Sweden. Oh, I forgot. There is a new startup from Orle Ingenas group that they are actually, uh, I forgot. Is it Epi Epishine, I think? Epishine, you're right, yes. Um, they are working uh, for commercializing the OPV for uh, indoor, indoor IoT applications. All right, perfect. And I guess just lastly here, just to finish with all the questions, are cellulose-based things conductive? Not necessarily, no. They are used as substrates, uh, but 
you can you can composite them i believe you can mix them uh with different conductive elements and uh, use them as as inks conductive inks or semiconducting inks Thank you.